Good morning. Is this uh, mic up and running? Everybody can hear me in the back? Great. Uh, welcome. Welcome, welcome. It's my, my privilege uh, to welcome all of you to this event celebrating America's federal workforce. My name is Andrew Mayock, and I'm senior advisor at the Office of Management and Budget, where I help steward the President's management agenda. The President's management agenda is focused on modernizing the federal government to make sure that we're delivering better, faster, and smarter services to citizens and American businesses. And we're here to celebrate the most important part of the President's management agenda, the people who make up the federal workforce. We're here to honor those who have dedicated their lives in service to this country. And we're here, to hear, we're here also to hear about how these public servants have done a number of extraordinary things, saving taxpayer money, reuniting families, improving how we buy goods and services, improving how we hire people, and delivering better customer service overall. Before we hear these stories, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you the Director of the Office of Management and Budget, Sean Donovan, who has dedicated his career to public service. Welcome, Sean. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, it is great to see all of you here today. Uh, it is a full house. I hear we have some White House Leadership Development Program fellows in the house. Where are you? All right. Give it up for them. We have winners of the 2016 President's Customer Service Awards in the house. Where are you guys? Come on. We've got OMB, OPM, OSTP, PPO staff who have made all of this work uh, possible. Give it up for them. And all the other partners who have worked with us to make today possible, uh, but to make great, great contributions to public service possible. I'm pleased that every one of you could be here today. Uh, I'm also glad that we have lots of people who are watching us today uh, by webcast. So if you're out there watching, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your public service. Now, I often say as the budget director, I spend time worrying about the fiscal deficit. But I also spend time worrying about the trust deficit that we have in this country. And the truth is that we all believe in the federal government and the mission that, that uh, we have here. But the work that we're all doing to make government better and stronger and faster and more efficient is also building the faith of the American people in their own government and in this institution, uh, the institutions of the federal government that we all work for. And if we all go back, for all of us, there's a reason somewhere back in our past that we decided to be committed to public service. I know my own story. I grew up in New York City in the 1960s and 1970s when, frankly, we thought our cities were falling apart. I remember as a kid walking to school past families sleeping on the street thinking to myself, how is it that in the wealthiest city, in the wealthiest country on earth, we can have kids and their parents sleeping on our streets? And so I committed myself to working on housing and homelessness, but I never imagined that one day I would get to be President Obama's HUD secretary and to work on issues of homelessness all around this country. I also would never have believed that I'd be able to stand here today and say that under the president's leadership, under the work of people like Ann Oliva and many, many others across this federal government, we've been able to cut the number of veterans sleeping on our streets or in shelters by half since 2010, that we've been able, since the president came into office in the middle of the worst economic crisis of our lifetimes, 
reduce the number of kids and families sleeping on our streets by two thirds since he came into office. That makes me enormously proud to be a public servant. And every one of you here has your own story of what brought you to public service. What made you think, if I want to change the world, I should go be a public servant because that's where I can make the most difference for the most people. And just thinking about what some of the folks in this room have done to serve the American people. Just one thing this year that we should be enormously proud of. We now have 21 million hours that we've saved for American citizens by setting up the Trusted Travelers program. That's making Americans safer when they travel. We know how important that is, but also saving them precious time as the father of two boys. That extra hour I may have to be home with my kids, the flight I didn't miss to be able to get home to a game or whatever it might be, those are precious hours for every American family. And you've done that. You saved 21 million hours for our travelers. You're making it easier for small businesses to get started by helping them access loans. 35,000 small businesses have been able to access loans through the new lending platform that you all in this room have, have set up. Think about what that means for those 35,000 folks that started a business. What it means for their future and their kids' future and the communities where those businesses have been set up. Think about the 60 million families who've been able to get access to their own energy data to be able to both make uh, their wallet uh, a little heavier in this holiday season. Maybe that means because of the savings they've gotten that they can buy an extra gift for under the tree or put money towards saving for their kids' college or whatever it might be. And at the same time, know that they're contributing to making the planet a little greener, a little healthier. Folks in this room have done that. So I'm incredibly proud of the work you've done, your commitment to public service. And I also know that the president himself is proud of that work and has your back. He has made it an absolute priority that while you're taking care of the American citizen, we're all taking care of you. What does that mean? That means we set up a White House leadership development program for aspiring SES to help make sure you're getting the training and development that you need. And the second cohort of that uh, fellowship is here today. One year ago today, we released an executive order to strengthen the SES and over the last year, Agencies have been speeding up hiring, improving the application process, uh, strengthening onboarding, initiating talent and succession management practices, all of those things to make sure we have the best possible talent that is in the SES and that we grow in the SES. And finally, just last week, the president submitted to Congress an alternative pay plan that implements a 2.1% pay increase for federal employees. <laughs> Nothing says thank you better <laughs> than recognizing the work that you do. We know this has not been an easy time with sequestration and shutdowns. And the president in one of the last uh, days of his administration wanted to make sure that he sent a message to each and every federal employee, to everyone in this room today, that you had his back and he's got your back. So thank you. Thank you for your public service. Thank you for the remarkable work that you do each and every day on behalf of this country. Speaking of someone who does remarkable work on behalf of this country and someone who cares deeply about public service and public servants, I have had the pleasure to work closely with the gentleman I'm about to introduce, our remarkable Chief of Staff. Give it up for Dennis McDonough. Uh, thanks, Sean, very much. Uh, thank you, Andrew, our newly uh, confirmed uh, Deputy Director of OMB. 
Um, that's a big. That's a big piece of business. Uh, welcome to the White House, and thanks for the opportunity to say good morning. Um, I just want to uh, say one thing uh, before introducing some remarks from the president, uh, and that's to say how proud I am to have been associated with each of you and the mission that you carry out every day. Uh, I see it. I see it as a dad um, every day in the things that my kids rely on that all of you work on. Uh, and you know what that is. It's everything that Sean just talked about. Um, it's also food safety, medical safety, transportation to school. Um, and that work is remarkable. But I also see it elsewhere uh, in the sit room where we can talk about it, um, in the chief of staff's office where um, you know, routinely we're seeing performance scores uh, way off the charts. Uh, and that's because of each of you, and that's because of the huge sacrifice that you make. And I just want you to know what a great blessing uh, it is to be associated with you and your fine work, and how uh, proud I am of the terrific uh, work uh, that you do to carry out the mission of working in an office every day where we get to fly the flag. And uh, you do the flag a uh, great honor. Uh, you do the president uh, very proud and the way you carry out your work uh, each and every day. So a particular thanks to our Presidential Rank Award winners, the President Consumer Service Award winners, and as Sean said, to the second class of White House Leadership, leadership Development Fellows, um, and to everybody here joining uh, this morning. And just know, please, uh, at least on behalf of this Chief of Staff, uh, what a great uh, honor it is to be associated with uh, with you and your fine work. So with that, I have a uh, the nice honor to uh, introduce a message to each of you from the president. So thank you very much. Happy holidays and congratulations. Hi, everybody. Before I leave office in a few weeks, I just wanted to thank you one more time for stepping forward to serve this country we love. I want you to know how much I admire the work that you do, day in and day out, and how deeply I appreciate your passion for public service, your professionalism, and the career path each of you has chosen. The American people have high expectations of their government. Trust me, I know. Your jobs aren't easy. Believe me, I know that too. I see you perform them with skill. But as I know you've experienced, the reward is in the opportunity to help your fellow citizen. So many of the vital services that the American people depend on cross your desk every day. Your work is essential to our national security and to families' economic security. You are the folks who help strangers after a storm or in the face of tragedy. You guard our borders and protect our civil rights. You keep our food and our workplaces safe and protect the air we breathe and the water we drink. You help businesses expand and enter new markets. You push the boundaries of science and space and guide hundreds of thousands of people each day through the glory of America's natural wonders. You promote diplomacy and development and defend our homeland from threats, foreign and domestic. And over these past eight years, you have hauled our government to a place where it is smarter and faster and more responsive to the needs of the American people in the 21st century. So whatever or whoever inspired you to join public service, whether you're a young person who just signed up because you want to make a difference, or a career employee who has dedicated your life to that pursuit, I want you to know that it has been my privilege to call you my colleagues. This precious experiment in self-government only works when we have selfless citizens like you. And it's when our politics feels most divisive that we're the most in need of people like you. It's times like now when we need people who show the rest of the country what it means when we say we are all Americans first. By choosing public service, you carry on a proud tradition at the heart of some of this country's greatest and most lasting achievements. So keep doing it. Your good work has never been more important. Public service has always been a noble calling and it will always be a noble calling. I'll always be grateful for what we've accomplished together and as a citizen who will continue to rely on the enormous differences you make, I'm excited to see what all of you do next. 
On behalf of Michelle and myself, thank you again for working so hard every single day in service of this country that we love so much. Thank you, Sean, and thank you, Dennis. Thanks to the President of the United States for joining us today. Um, and now we have that opportunity uh, to hear directly from people who have taken up that noble call, uh, to sh people who are showing every day that we are all Americans first. Um, so uh, I'm pleased uh, to welcome to the stage the following folks, Anne-Marie Oliva, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Special Needs from the Department of Housing and Herb Urban Development with 15 years of federal service. Welcome. <laughs> Tracy Walker is also here. Tracy is the Director of Digital Services Procurement at the U.S. Digital Service, also with 15 years of federal service. Welcome, Tracy. <laughs> and lastly, Kyle Hare, Director of Lean Management at the Food and Drug Administration. Welcome, Kyle. With that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Ann. Uh, thank you, and good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Again, my name is Ann Oliva. I am the, thank you, I am the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Special Needs at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which means that I have uh, oversight of the department's portfolio on homelessness under my purview. And I'm particularly proud to be here today to talk with you all um, because I think not only is this a perfect topic to point to when we're celebrating our federal workforce, but it's a testament to the power of public policy and the impact it can have on people's lives. So I'm here today to tell you the story of our work on ending homelessness among veterans in the United States. And I think the most important place for us to start is with the fact that this initiative included both top-down and bottom-up components. On the operational side, it was driven by a team of career staff in uh, headquarters as well as in the field, and that staff was dedicated to developing and implementing policy and programs that are geared towards ending homelessness among veterans. We were able to make the kind of progress that Sean sort of stole my thunder on, um, but I won't take it personally. Um, we were able to make that kind of progress in part due to the focus of our leaders and the ability to count on our leadership when we, the staff, got stuck. And at the end of the day, we all knew exactly what our goal was and each of our roles in ch achieving that goal. So let's take a quick moment to look at the problem that we were actually trying to solve. In 2010, 70, over 76,000 veterans were experiencing homelessness on a single night across the United States. We enumerate that through something called our point in time count, and many more veterans experienced homelessness over the course of a year. As you can see by the chart, um, we actually didn't have enough housing to help all of those veterans, and frankly, we actually didn't have a comprehensive or collaborative mechanism to help those veterans. So when the administration uh, adopted the goal of ending veteran homelessness by 2015. The teams at VA, HUD, and the U.S. Interag Interagency Council on Homelessness uh, tried to figure out how we could possibly meet that audacious goal. And we decided that the only way that we could do it was through clear, consistent coordination and collaboration between agencies. And that meant overcoming differences in agency cultures, deciding on what data to use, what metrics were important to us, and most importantly, that meant that each agency would be giving up just a little bit of its own autonomy to benefit veterans who are experiencing homelessness across this country, because we knew that none of us could get there alone. Our agency leaders were willing to back us up, uh, to not just back us up, but to walk the walk literally. It showed commitment on part of the agencies from the top of our agencies and from the staff. And we, the staff, didn't sugarcoat the problem or tell our leadership only the good news. 
We aired it all in front of our leaders and our leaders appreciated both our honesty and our hard work. So I'm sure you're asking yourself, what does this sort of mean operationally? And what it means is that the staff got together and created the notion of a virtual single agency. We called ourselves Solving Veteran Homelessness as One. And in the simplest of terms, it means that on the issue of veteran homelessness, HUD, VA, and the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness work as a single unit in making program and policy decisions. We created a charter and a formal structure that includes a core group of decision makers, including myself, who are supported by a talented team of subject matter experts, experts that work on day-to-day uh, -day operations. Our teams in the field, which number in the thousands, execute the vision by working with veterans every day to get them into housing. And then we meet monthly with an agenda that's set by the support team so that we can tackle critical barriers, review a monthly dashboard of key metrics, and problem solve together. Every other quarter, we meet with our uh, leaderships so they can hold us accountable for, what, uh, for the work that we're doing. And obviously, this has evolved and been refined over time. We don't always agree, we don't always get along, but we have a structure that we're all bought into to work through all of these problems um, and issues constructively and quickly. And in looking back, I think that our success can be attributed to some, really, to some key factors. And the first is that we're clear, the staff is clear on the mission and all of our activity is oriented towards that mission. We agree, we agree on uh, common benchmarks and common data sets. We understand the need in the field and our capacity to meet that need. We've created mechanisms for communication and decision making. We hold each other accountable and talk to each other every day. And the most important piece of this is that we are always looking for ways to improve and to execute on those ways to improve. Because this is the reason right here uh, what we're doing is so important. We see it at the staff level and our leadership makes sure that they see it as well. So in January 2016, on a single night in January, <clears throat> on a single night, I'm happy to report that we saw a decrease in homelessness among veterans of nearly half since 2010. That included a decrease of over 56% uh, in the number of veterans who are sleeping on our streets. And to date, more than 35 cities in three states have declared an effective end to veteran homelessness. So, <clears throat> so really, these are the reasons that we're all here today, because without the dedication, compassion, and ingenuity of our federal workforce, we wouldn't have made this progress, and we wouldn't have the confidence, I wouldn't have the confidence to stand here in front of all of you today and say that uh, we will see an end to veteran homelessness soon. So thank you for your time. Good morning. So we all know that the government struggles with delivering digital solutions to our citizens. With the launch of healthcare.gov initially, we had a problem with not only the technology, but in also the way that it was contracted for. We focused on service contracts with compliance instead of working software solutions. So the U.S. Digital Service was created in 2014 to help the government with not only the way that we build, but also the way we buy digital services. Now, the federal acquisition regulations and the community around this struggles with the fact that contracting is hard. We have to leverage taxpayers' dollars and make sure we're a good steward with them. We have to uphold competition. We have to make sure we're looking at socioeconomic um, uh, categories and making sure that we also help agencies with their missions and being able to deliver on that. We also rely on uh, traditionally software development methods called waterfall, which really uh, is characterized by upfront requirements which go through a process of delivery. The problem with defining all of your requirements upfront is that technology changes quickly. And so in order to change the contracts, it usually involves extending the schedules, extending the cost of this, and so all of a sudden we're delivering in years instead of months. But the good news is the government is changing and we're adopting um, industry models and methods such as agile software development, lean UX, human-centered design, and this will make it easier for us to get the hand, uh, into the hands of our end users solutions that make sense for them. And if they work, great, we can keep going and scaling that, and if they don't, then we can pivot quickly without a lot of sunk costs. 
But in order to change not only the technology solutions, we also have to relook at the way that we do the contracts for this. If we try to put an agile software development system into a uh, uh, structured and, and compliance-based contract, it's going to fail. And so the TechFAR handbook was released alongside with the Digital Service Playbook in order to demonstrate the flexibilities that already exist within the federal acquisition regulation space that is saying go ahead and innovate and go ahead and adopt commercial practices and industry practices while still ma maintaining the rules and regulations. These are some of the strategies that we're applying within the TechFAR uh, handbook as well as at the U.S. Digital Service in order to make these acquisitions better. We really want to focus on modular contracting and paying for working products. We want to make sure that we're not driving uh, industry uh, participants who want to come and work for the government away with the fact that we have long acquisition lead times and costly solicitation processes. And we also know that you can des uh, design the perfect contract, but it won't be successful unless you have people that know how to both negotiate it and know how to implement it back in the agencies. So I started my federal career in Kansas City, uh, Missouri, and so I'm a show me kind of girl. And uh, so in, in our acquisition community, it's very important for us to not only hear what people are telling us to do, but to actually know how to, to do it. So show me how this can actually be done. So the digital service procurement team is composed of contracting officers, contracting officer representatives, and industry specialists who've actually been developing and designing uh, digital service acquisitions in the space over the last five years. And we've been successful most of the time, we've made some mistakes, and we have a body of knowledge that we want to share with the rest of the federal government in order to help you all adopt these strategies faster. With the launch of the Acquisition Gateway, uh, GSA's knowledge portal for the acquisition community which addresses all of federal procurement, we carved ourselves out a niche and we're calling this the TechFAR Hub. This is available both on the public and the private side of the Acquisition Gateway. And what the TechFAR Hub is really a way for us to communicate with our end users, which is the acquisition community, um, how we can do these types of procurements and also to share the success stories in this area. It's broken down into three main places which the first one is Discover It. So this includes training opportunities, uh, Anne Rung's podcast series on digital service acquisitions, as well as field guides and also information related to events that are going to be upcoming. The Discuss It is a community uh, space for us to have the practitioners uh, not only interact with the community um, internal, but also with our federal work, uh, the federal workforce and the people that are selling uh, those services to us. And then do it, this is the really exciting part, this is where we're actually building tools, such as the Solicitation Builder, which translate the, di the digital service playbook into a statement of objective, or an IGCE calculator, so you understand how to buy agile teams instead of just individual labor categories. This also includes the samples and the templates that I know every single contracting officer I've ever engaged with, their first question is, can I get a sample? Yes, you can, and here they are. <laughs> uh, so the case studies that we're trying to put up there relate uh, similarly to one of the case studies we did with SBA.gov when we did a USDS discovery sprint. Right after we finished that and gave them recommendations, they wanted to implement that in a contract. And so we were able to work with them to compete an acquisition on uh, basically in three and a half months. And after the kickoff in July, they had a uh, environment ready with uh, it was based on cloud, open source software, which is something new to the agency, and they delivered something in nine months after deciding that they actually needed to conduct and, and put this out. And so that was the Am I Eligible tool, which tells women-owned small businesses whether or not they're able to get uh, a certification within the government. They've since been iterating, and now they're um, being successful. So we need your success stories. We need you to help contribute to this and help us with this federal adoption of digital service acquisitions. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, what an honor it is to be here. Uh, I feel compelled to share with you that I'm a second generation uh, career civil servant. So any opportunity that I have to honor federal excellence in public service is just an indeed an honor for me. So congratulations to all the awardees and thank you for having me. Um, again, my name is Kyle Hare and I'm the director of an in-house process improvement and consulting team called Cedar Lean at the Food and Drug Administration's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. 
Our mission at the FDA in CEDAR is simple, using the best possible science available towards our regulatory activities. And our mission is far-reaching. Over 25 cents of every dollar spent in the U.S. is spent on an FDA-regulated product. And sometimes, when a patient takes a medicine, those drugs can cause an adverse reaction. And when that happens, we get a phone call. The FDA gets notified. And when the FDA gets enough data, we need to deliberate what to do, just what to do. So as we know, every drug has both its risks and its benefits. So this deliberation can take some time. Meanwhile, many people continue taking drugs or continue taking that, that product and can have adverse events happen to them. So sometimes the FDA is referred to as a black box. And that's because we don't have transparency into how our process works or when we go through a process or the timing with the deliberations for these adverse events. So our mission in this project was very clear. The sooner that we could let the public know our thinking, then the fewer people that would be harmed. That was our goal. So the Drug Safety Communication, or DSC, is our formal communication mechanism within the FDA to let patients and healthcare providers know of the potential adverse events that can happen with these drugs. And these uh, DSCs are actually published on our website, so we know that those reach over millions of users. So the sooner that we can get those drug safety communications onto our website and cleared, then we can translate in that into fewer adverse events for patients. So, in this project, what do you get when you have over 25 organizations and five levels of bureaucratic review? You have an over nine month long process that it takes for a drug safety communication to be issued to the public. That was just simply too long. So, in this project, we use the lean process improvement design approach of continuous improvement, and it has four phases, plan, do, check, and act. So, in the first step, many of our projects and our project team members would say something like this. Well, in our organization, we do this process this way. And normally somebody, normally on the other side of the room would say, huh, that's interesting. In our organization, we thought you did it this way, and we do it that way in our organiza organization as well. So that simple dialogue with people focusing on the process and not on each other was really the first step in gaining towards efficiencies. And once that entire process was well documented, the real work of finding and eliminating those inefficiencies could begin. So the team had four targeted solutions within this project. The first being the message variability and quality of drug safety communications. Second being the number of review cycles or the cycles with which those communications were cleared. Third, the total process time or lead time, end-to-end -end time that it took to clear those, and lastly, duplication of effort or any inefficiencies. So there was a nine-month-long pilot, and the team realized several things. First being that one of the suggested solutions was simply not being used by the subject matter experts or the people who actually do the work. The second thing was that we found that there were simple inefficiencies and redundancies and duplications of effort that could be eliminated right away. So those were quick wins for the team. So, what do you get when you have an over nine month long process and you have a process improvement team where you have subject matter experts and senior leadership involved? You get a two month reduction and a reduction in the total lead time that it takes to have a drug safety communication issued to the public. That's an over 75% improvement and a direct benefit to the, uh, to the patients in the United States. But the indirect benefit was even more reaching increased collaboration, increased communication and awareness, and a cohort of, of process improvement experts that could come and lead this process going forward. So what did we learn? Several things. The first, communication at all levels, having that crosstalk and that dialogue between senior leadership and subject matter experts. A strong change advocates across organizations as well, and empowered staff, people feeling that their voice would be heard, and real-time collection of metrics so we could tell whether our project was successful or not. And of course, 
None of this would have been possible without the key stakeholders and the senior leadership involved. Thank you. Thank you, Ann, Tracy, and Kyle. Kyle, I think I might be following up with you on uh, presentation prep. <laughs> Some very cool slides there uh, and very compelling. Uh, and uh, in addition to uh, these three that have answered that noble call, I uh, want to introduce our uh, next partner who answered the noble call uh, from California and Silicon Valley to come join uh, the president and his administration. Uh, Megan Smith, the U.S. Chief Technology Officer and Assistant to the President in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Megan is going to share with us uh, the very interesting co concept of legal theft uh, <laughs> and, and within the federal government, the stealing of ideas, and uh, five more people who are having impact across the federal government. Welcome, Megan. Hi, everybody. So we're going to um, do rapid fire spark talks. And we're going to show some amazing things that uh, people have been doing, these guys have been doing. And we could have taken anyone in this room and put you up here. Like, it is extraordinary to have read some of the things that you all are doing. And the thing that's true, one of the things that's hard in government is that we're so big that we often talk about what we're doing and this policy and stuff, not as much who. But if you really think about venture capitalists, when they're going to you know, fuel our best companies, our best ideas, they're looking for what idea do you have and who's the team, right? So you find, you don't, uh, you know, Twitter and what's the team, that kind of thing. And so it's really helpful, I think, to sometimes see our colleagues, what they're up to and connect with them and think about the kind of collaboration you were just talking about that we can have. Um, also, one of my favorite inventions is actually the Pony Express. And that's a funny thing, uh, but it's so cool and innovative that people just figured out how to get this done. Do you know how long it lasted? Anybody? 18 months. And then it was disrupted. Telegraph, right? So this country has an extraordinary skill at upgrading ourselves constantly. And if you even go, like we're standing in the building, we're to get today together in this building that marks the beginning of the American century and the industrial age, right? So 1871 was the beginning of this building. And so at each moment, we, the Americans, in our American experiment, the president was talking about, step up. And so whether it's the founding fathers and mothers and the beginning and the fact that President Washington started the Army Corps of Engineers before the country was founded, or whether it was FDR innovating the fireside chat to connect better with our community of all the Americans. Or whether it's President Kennedy, who figured out how to really do all hands on deck, everybody in, let's go. You know, Sputnik started teaching science and tech everywhere and really getting all Americans into the game, which led us to Apollo. I got to see the Hidden Figures movie this weekend, which is extraordinary, which includes some of the stories that were untold. So we have this history. And so without further ado, we're gonna start off, uh, first off, no one better to serve than our veterans, Marianne Brody. Good morning, everybody. I am happy to be here. I'm Marianne Brody, and I'm going to talk to you about Vets.gov. So the first thing that I want you to do is imagine Dominic. Dominic is a real person. He is a 35-year-old veteran of the United States Army. At the time this picture was taken, he was working at a discount retail store to pay the rent on his new apartment and to support his children. He hadn't seen a doctor since 2008, and if you asked him if he'd apply for health care at the VA, he would have said, yeah, I've applied dozens of times. This isn't unusual. Um, a lot of people try to access services from the government, and sometimes they struggle because it can be really hard. Users who are trying to access services from the VA have to muddle through over a thousand websites, close to a thousand phone numbers, and even sometimes still they can't find what they need. In the case of the healthcare application, on a good day when Dominic was able to get where he needed to go, when he clicked on the healthcare application form, he would get this message that he needed to update his PDF reader. So imagine empowering a small team of technologists to build uh, better government services using modern development practices. Imagine that they worked alongside veterans and alongside career civ civil servants at the agency. Enter vets.gov. 
Vets.gov is a single platform that enables veterans to discover, apply for, track, and manage the benefits that they have earned. Today on Vets.gov, a veteran can apply for health care, refill their prescription, uh, send their doctor a secure message, check the status of their disability claim, and uh, search for a VA facility, all using one single secure login. Our team has spent countless hours over the past year talking to veterans of all abilities and backgrounds to learn about them and incorporate their feedback to make the site as easy to use as possible. In addition, we have spent just as much time with our partners at the VA to understand the plumbing that goes into the systems that we are working with. So imagine designing with users, not for them, and what could happen when user needs and not the limitations of government structures and silos can create um, and, and inform decisions in technical and design work. Thank you. Awesome. You know, we get so many letters into the White House from folks, and one of the creative ideas was the White House correspondence team was part of your group because they uh, helped find him. So, you know, it, it takes a whole group of us to do this work. The president was at South by Southwest, and he said to that group, I need you to come serve in the government, and I want you to team up with my incredible team who knows these topics, knows how to do this, and together we're going to solve the harder problems. Uh, he kind of teased a little bit about love all the restaurant delivery apps, but we need some help over here. Uh, and the thing that's been interesting about coming is uh, I feel like um, some of my skills are like pumping up the tires on extraordinary things that you guys all know. And it's when we get really cross-functional, like we do when we're at war uh, and other times, can we do that at peacetime against all of our hardest problems? So one of the things that I know, uh, Beth is in the room, you know, hiring is something that you have really worked on innovating on. And so next up, uh, Angie Bailey, an extraordinary result that happened on behalf of cyber. Go. So I'll start out just like every federal agency, DHS had an issue. We had tons of vacant positions within our cyber and our technology workforce. And then you couple with that all of the myths that go around hiring. It's too hard to hire. You can't make on the job, uh, job offers. You can't, um, nobody actually even wants to work for the federal government and especially millennials. So we decided to take all of that and debunk most of those myths. We pulled together as one agency. Every single component came together. Uh, under one umbrella and what we decided to do was announce those job announcements across all of DHS rather than component by component. And as a result of that, we had over 14,000 people apply to our jobs online. <coughs> over 2,000 people walked in the door to help us fill 350 cyber and tech jobs. As a result of that, we pulled together 400 DHS volunteers from across every single component. We brought in every cool toy that DHS has to offer, including the President's limo, and we even managed to get a Coast Guard cutter not only across to, uh, Washington, D.C., but into a hotel and did not damage one chandelier. <laughs> and as a result of that, we pulled together every HR specialist and every cyber technology person that we had. We sat them side by side just like this. As the people walked in and the applications came in, we qualified them on the spot. We ran them down to a hiring manager who took them in to an interview room. We interviewed over 850 people that day. We made 200 uh, on-the-spot job, uh, on job offers that particular day, and we weren't done then. We know that most people leave and actually don't go through the security process, so we fingerprinted them and, ran and put them into the security process. As a result of that, and as a result of that, we kind of call it the gift that keeps on giving. We're up to 430 plus job offers already. Over half of those folks have already reported to work. Uh, 60 of them came on the job within six weeks, and these are with TSSCI clearances. So the bottom line is, is that when you believe that you can't do something, all you really have to do is just sit down, come together, and you actually can get it done. Thank you. Next up, John's going to be at the podium. Um, there's a great idea called community of practice. It's just simple peer-to-peer -peer learning. 
And so we've formed all kinds of community practice. Sometimes we call them interagency. But there's ways to accelerate them, having listservs and having all different ways of connecting more rapidly and sharing content. Uh, and one of the things we have is we have a CTO uh, team uh, community practice. And so I got to know John uh, through that. And what I love, uh, just like you guys, I'm sure, experience, when you're together with the people who have similar jobs to you across the government, somebody's doing something that you need, right? It's always true. And so if we can figure out how to, to really scale our communities of practice of like stealing ideas from each other in our same roles and then seeing the cross-cut stuff that we could do anywhere, uh, we would really accelerate our stuff. And one of my favorite ones is, of course, the greatest asset of the federal government is our talent. And so John had a wonderful innovation for how to bring more of our talent into the digital age. So go. At the Social Security Administration, we believe in securing today and tomorrow. We have been taking plays out of the digital playbook and focusing on IT modernization. We have been focused on code, data, and infrastructure modernization. We have also been focused on human capital modernization and decided to run an experiment where we sent 100 employees to an immersive software engineering boot camp. 60 of these employees were entry-level new hires and 40 were experienced developers. The 60 entry-level employees were sent to a 12-week boot camp this is a short story about the experience of those 60 entry-level employees. At first they were confused. Some of them wondered why they got themselves into. Others thought they would never be programmers. Then there was information overload, like drinking through a fire hose. Frustration set in. Many of them thought things were moving too fast. There was no way they could keep up. By week six they were exhausted. Many of them didn't know what day it was. Then things started to make sense. The pieces started to come together. Then it was time to team up and apply what they learned and develop a project in just two weeks. Then it was time to demo the project to SSA leadership. Despite all the challenges the teams had to overcome, utilizing open source solutions and harvesting the API economy, these teams created an amazing set of applications. They truly blew us away. One team created a ride-sharing application utilizing Google Maps APIs. Another team created a Slack-like application that was truly impressive and fully functional. Another team created an application using weather.com APIs that would play a song based on your mood and the local weather conditions. And there were several others. These teams are now back at SSA applying the modern software engineering skills that they learned at boot camp and creating amazing applications for us and the American public. Human capital modernization is one way we are securing today and tomorrow at the Social Security Administration. Thank you. I love uh, what John has achieved. And um, the thing that I know also is that you not only took the technical folks and you had different forms. You, I know you had a 12 week for the, the folks who were new hires, but also a four week for upgrading your current team. And then you also I know had analysts and the managers. And so it was sort of respecting everybody and how a team works and getting everyone this fluency. And I'll tell you, upstairs on the fourth floor, there's actually a code uh, boot camp going on, a, a one-day burst class that my colleague Alex McGivery is teaching who came to government. He used to be the general counsel of Twitter. He's a coder lawyer. So we can do this if we just do it, right? So that's the way that that's what we're thinking about. The other thing is... Uh, Avi Bender couldn't be here, but he was uh, one of the leaders at Census and, and created a physical lab space with the Census team. It's right next to the cafeteria. And so one of the things that's an interesting thing to think about is status quo is a policy decision. And so if you don't do something, you're actually making a decision. And so what is cool about what Avi figured out is it's sometimes hard to start. But what he did was they created this space with the administrator next to the cafeteria that was really welcoming. And anyone could walk in and have their idea and start to think of sprints and how to debug, how might I do that or that or that? Or I have this problem. They had 400 projects go through. So just brilliant, brilliant work. And, uh, and we're working right now, we're, we're gonna have the State Department Library, the original State Department in this building. Our librarians are gonna make it a little louder librarian. 
space so that we can have an innovation space here in EOP. And I hope all of you are thinking about where is our space that's the community innovation space and that helps us upgrade our talent and get them in the flow, both through really rapid, cool training, which is very similar to President's Tech Hire initiative now has 70 cities. Uh, IronR just came into DC and they're working with you guys, as well as physical spaces and flow and then the collaboration tools that we need to make it move really quickly.